Welcome to this video summary of the BC COVID-19 Modeling Group's report for July 7th, 2021. So just a quick reminder, um, the BC COVID-19 Modeling Group is a group of academics and associated individuals who are um, using their statistics, modeling, and data analysis skills to um, build projections and try and estimate uh, some of the features of uh, the, um, the ongoing pandemic, including the behavior of some of the variants. And our goal is to do this to supplement the efforts of the BC government, BC CDC, and uh, the Ministry of Health in um, managing the pandemic. So let me start with a short summary of the key messages from this week's report. First up, the step two reopening on June 15th, which we anticipated would cause a change in the rate of decline of, in cases, did not cause enough change to switch to growth. As you likely already know if you're watching the case data, we continue to see decline through June and into July. So concerns over the Delta variant still plague us, but estimates indicate that Delta is remaining roughly constant or possibly declining slightly. Um, the data is not clear enough to distinguish at this point. Despite the overall decline, Delta continues to rise in frequency relative to the other existing variants in BC. So given the nearly constant trend in Delta cases, the step three reopening on July 1st that we just went through recently uh, could push the Delta growth rate positive, or it could be compensated for by ongoing vaccination progress. So it's not clear yet whether that balance is in place. An interesting complication with the projections uh, is what I call behavioral inertia. As we've seen in the data with previous reopenings, there's a lag while people adapt to the idea of interacting more. At the moment, things like wearing masks indoors and staying home when sick are still important, but it seems like it will be sometime before everyone is ready to return to the level of interaction currently endorsed by uh, public health policy. And what that means is the parameters in the models will be changing gradually over time and it's hard to really predict exactly how that's gonna roll out. So um, vaccination progress is moving along really well and latest polls indicate that vaccine hesitancy is decreasing. We're also now able to detect the impact of um, vaccination on the spread of infections at the level of community health service areas. So this here is Jens von Bergman's uh, summary graph of the case count. We've seen this graph before with a little bit of data added here at the end. Uh, so <clears throat> the continuing decline in cases that we've seen for a while now um, is pretty clear and the impact of steps one and two are at best visible in the slight change here in the slope. Um, it's too early to see the impact of step three, which just recently happened. So here is Dean Carlin's model fits from uh, June 16th for the entire province up here and broken out um, by health authorities in the other five plots. And as you can see, those predictions showed this ongoing continual decline. And despite these little bumps and hiccups in some of the regions, we're seeing that uh, decline is you know restarted even there. So zooming in on the tail of that in the May and June period, um, so Dean has added in in blue here the mo more recent data that was not included in the fitting, and you can see that the projections are really lining right up with that new data that's coming out. So this is pretty much as expected. The added component here is Dean has added in the Delta variant, and you can see it's at very low numbers uh, at this point. Um, and we'll say a little bit more about uh, that in the next slides. So projections of Delta's behavior after step three uh, isn't included here. And we'll have to wait until there's enough data post reopening to estimate the resulting changes in transmissions. Although I will say something about another model in which, um, you know, I'll show some um, projections for a few different possible scenarios. Here we take a look at Sally Otto's analysis of the variants in BC. We continue to watch Delta, but the data is problematic, which I'll comment on more on a later slide. Just looking at the data from June, 
we see all variants are, appear to be in decline. The growth rate point estimates are all negative, as you can see here in this list, for alpha, gamma, um, others, and delta. Um, but the confidence intervals for a few of these include zero. So this means that I can't really make any strong statement about the decline from this particular data. But what I can point out here is that the selective advantage of, of delta over alpha is estimated from other data from the United States, from Alberta, to be somewhere around 0.08 per day, which basically means that um, this number should be about 0.8 lower than this number. And if you take a look at the confidence intervals and you try and make, reconcile that, it basically says that delta has to be pretty close to zero. So we're hovering at basically a, a zero growth rate in delta at this point. So once again, Sally has peeked over the border into Alberta to see what's going on with Delta there. They've seen similar declines in overall case numbers that we've seen in BC, but that decline has masked a slow growth in Delta. So the selective advantage of Delta in Alberta is estimated to be around um, 0.1, which is 10% uh, per day. And the growth rate is close to zero or slightly positive. Uh, and that corresponds to a doubling time of months. So this is, this is very slow growth, but this is before the recent reopening step taken there on July 1st. So the effect of that July 1st opening could bring down that doubling time to uh, a you know, much shorter period, depending on how dramatic that, the, the transmission rates uh, become or how, how dramatic they change. Okay, so here we have uh, Elisha Are and Carolyn Kaline's model, and it's now accounting for um, for uh, increased. Oops, uh, let's see here. It's for, uh, accounting for increased transmission and somewhat decreased vaccine efficacy for Delta. Um, and what they've done is they've proposed a couple different scenarios. Uh, one in which they increase contact rates on July 1st by 25% and the other situation where they increase it by 50%. And what you can see is that a 25% increase in contact rates, so a, a sort of a, a moderate reopening, uh, still is it's robust decline there. We still see a decline in case numbers. But if you're, if you're going to go with a 50% increase in contact rates, then we're going to see um, uh, a beginning of uh, growth regime again. So what exactly happened on July 1st is yet to be seen. We don't know if we're in the 25% or the 50% increase uh, scenario. Um, but it's worth noting that the projected doubling time for the 50% scenario, uh, even still there, it's, uh, it's long enough leaving us enough time to see the trends before cases mount to levels of, for example, the last two waves. So, um, so just because we have growth doesn't mean we're in short-term trouble, but it has to be watched carefully, obviously. Okay, so now we turn to the vaccination story, summarized for us by Bryn Wiley here. Um, and as you can see, first dose progress is in red and orange. That's the stuff here. And the second dose progress in green. So you can see that First doses have come well along much of the population, you know, broken into cohorts. They're over the 75% vaccination level, and the younger cohorts are still catching up as they've um, started getting their vaccination appointments a little bit later. Um, and second doses are really moving along quite rapidly in the wake of the first doses. So... Um, uh, so that's really good news and good progress. So recall that the herd immunity target is up here around the mid to low 80s. That number is defined as the immunized fraction of the population above which we expect to see the epidemic die out. So that immunity can come either from having been infected or having been vaccinated, but recall that the vaccines are only partially effective, so not all vaccinations count towards that target. For example, if the uh, efficacy 
of the vaccine is 90%, then only 90% of the vaccinated group of people count towards reaching that herd immunity. So uh, the latest polls indicate that around 90% of BC is now willing to get vaccinated, which means we're, we're operating out of this wedge here. In other words, nothing up here is achievable unless these 90% or these extra 10% can be convinced to be vaccinated. Furthermore, only 90% of those are eligible because they're um, you know, over the age of 12. So the upper bound on the immunity that we can achieve in the population is around here. Now, comparing that to the herd immunity line, which we said was somewhere in this range, we're already seeing a little bit of a mismatch there. In other words, herd immunity is looking like it's difficult to get to. So um, complicating that, we have the issue of efficacy. So um, that brings that upper bound here down somewhere, let's say, depending if you say 90% efficacy, maybe it's over here, but you know, maybe there's some lower efficacy. It depends on here are the confidence intervals for each of the different vaccines. So anyway, the message here is that we are very unlikely to reach herd immunity um, through vaccination. So here's another view on vaccinations. Uh, from an international perspective, we see that BC is looking uh, similar and perhaps eventually head of the UK and Israel. Let me just zoom in here. So you can see this is our first dose count so far and second doses are coming up rapidly. Uh, and, you know, maybe we'll be somewhere a little bit ahead of the UK. And um, uh, it, it, so interestingly, uh, both the UK and Israel are seeing a rise in Delta that's forcing them to delay reopening or reintroduce restrictions. Um, the demographics of vaccination may play a role in how the Delta story unfolds here. And it's worth noting that Delta is likely to grow here as we reopen more, but the numbers so far suggest that the growth will be slow enough to allow us to watch and respond. This is a new and encouraging analysis from Sally Otto. Plotted here are the percentage vaccination in various community health service areas across the province, plotted against a normalized daily case rate in that area. So the fit, which you see through here, suggests that an increase in vaccinations from, say, about 70% up to 83% uh, brings the case rate down from, in this case, just shy of two down to below one, so down by a factor of a half. So even without reaching herd immunity, we can see a dramatic slowing of spread as vaccination coverage increases. This slide, assembled by Sally Otto, is intended to demonstrate what vaccine efficacy tells us about post-vaccination behavior. On the left here, you see uh, the predicted vaccination progress over the summer. Right now, a large fraction of the population have been vaccinated at least once, so we're looking at this area here. Um, and by the end of August, over 70% of the population ought to have received their second dose. So that's how we interpret these regions. Given the efficacy of the vaccines, we can see on the right here, the fraction of new cases that are caused by once, twice, or unvaccinated individuals. You can see that by the end of the summer, about one-fifth of cases will be caught from somebody that has been twice vaccinated but got infected anyway. This is why it will still be important to get tested when you've been exposed, stay home when sick, mask indoors in public, and return slowly to normal as long as COVID is still circulating. So we've commented before on the difficulty that the public, ourselves included, have had accessing, accessing accurate and current data. Problems still persist. So BC variant, the BC variant reports are partial contain errors and are not updated as more data are gathered and corrected behind the scenes. And although the sequence data is finally being shared on GISAID, um, there's still no data for late May through to July, the period of time that really matters for making relevant projections and monitoring existing and emerging variants. 
So summarizing, uh, the step one and two reopenings have not reversed the ongoing decline in cases, which is great news. Uh, going forward, we really have to pay attention to the fast-growing Delta as we continue to reopen, given its significant growth advantage over uh, the existing established variants and its near-zero growth rate, which makes further reopenings critically dependent on continued vaccination progress. Finally, accurate and reliable reporting of variant data that permits external analysis is important to maintain public confidence in decision-making. For more details on the data issues we're concerned about, check out this link here in the PDF of the report that's available on our website. And that is our report for July 7th, 2021.